Dobra, kolana. So, hello, I'm Yvette and Michael. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, it's Saturday night, um, to talk about silence of suicide. Um, hello, hello, welcome. How are you? <laughs> hello, hi. It's great to be here. We've been really looking forward to tonight, haven't we? Yeah, so, yeah. thank you very much for inviting us. Oh, my pleasure. Um, um, so, just to introduce your, yourself a little bit to the audience tonight. Um, so Eva is the CEO of a charity called Silence of Suicide. You can see the lovely purple banner behind uh, both Yvette and Michael. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> um, and then obviously, you know, uh, Michael uh, Masfield QC is one of the most famous, um, you know, uh, <laughs> baristas in the country. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much for um, joining us today. And you both have kindly accepted my invitation to speak at the summit at the very, very, very last minute <laughs> when your diary is full for the rest of you, the year. So <laughs> honestly, thank you so much for, for your kindness. <laughs> problem no problem at all uh lovely um so uh, we just want to maybe do a, like a brief intro about you know what you do um first for the audience please so Yvette I know you 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 are doing a lot of different work you know you are the CEO of the um, SOS but you also have you know do a lot of campaign work and, and documentaries and filming so tell us a little bit about what you do as well for the audience please <laughs> Oh gosh, do you know what, when you put it like that, I realise how, how many things I do try and do actually. I'm not sure how successfully in some cases, but but we give it a go. Yes, yeah, so obviously I'm CEO of SOS, which which takes up the majority of my time. It, it's very all embracing and, and all consuming actually. Sometimes I actually feel like it's eating me up alive. I really do, uh, but in a good way. Um, yes, I campaign on behalf of specific issues uh, like the pensions issue and uh, women's pension issues. And also, um, I was part of the Cumberland Review into medicines and medical devices. So those are just a couple of things that I've done. Um, and, and also sometimes help Michael with a bit of his research. Um, and that, that can be quite interesting. So yeah, a hell of a lot going on. And uh, sometimes there aren't enough hours in the day, is what I will say, yeah. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. That's lovely. I'm um, sounding really busy. <laughs> oh, lovely. Um, Michael, please say hello to us. Then, you know, you know, we know where you to talk. Could you just tell us what you, you, you know about my day job? Oh, my God. <laughs> it's got out. I, I wonder. Okay. <laughs> oh, fantastic. All right. Okay. So I, I have a, you know, series of questions for you. Um, you know, obviously, you know, I, I know you both and, you know, what you've done, a lot of work around suicide to, to you know, fight the stigma around it and stuff. So if you don't mind, I could maybe start a few questions for you. And for the audience, um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And um, please pop in the chat where you are tuning in from tonight. And then if there are any questions um, throughout the session, please just pop in, in the chat and we'll try to answer it um, as we go through. So um, if that's okay, if there, and um, maybe I would like to ask your question first. Um, so I believe as a child, you sort of suffered bullying at an all girls boarding school, which sounds quite horrible to be honest. Um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about that, please. Yeah, I, th I think it's really important because you know, as you grow up, you realize you're not just susceptible to bullying as a child. Um, you're susceptible to it as an adult as well. What's really important to note is that the impact upon you as a child can be carried through your whole life and affect the way you feel about yourself, the way you believe other people perceive you. And, you know, it can plague you with self-doubt um, and insecurity, you know, all horrible negative things that actually none of us should feel not all of the time anyway so it's a really negative experience but I'm, I'm also really interested in what why people bully why are they bullying you know is it because they have their own sets of insecurities their own problems at home maybe or in other areas of their lives and that's what brings out that side of them I mean my experience was um and never to this day and, and it's weird because I'm, I'm in touch with some of the people that I used to know from my school days. And most of them don't remember it. And they certainly don't remember why I was excluded. 
But for the whole of my final year at the school, I was completely ignored. I mean, I was literally physically ghosted. You know, no one would talk to me at all. And I actually ran away. <laughs> and um, I didn't actually run that far. I was just hiding in some toilets down by the gymnasium. Yeah, but nobody thought to look that far. So that was my idea of running away. But it's funny that afterwards the school didn't discuss it. Uh, you know, nobody talked to me about it, even, even my parents. They just said, don't be so silly. And, and so that attitude, unfortunately, leads you to believe, well, <clears throat> you know, I, I am being silly. I, I'm being weak. I'm not meant to talk about this. This is the way it's going to be. And that's that. And, you know, I couldn't wait to get out of there. The last day of school for me was like, yeah, great. I'm out of here. Um, but did it affect me? Absolutely. Does it still affect me now in certain ways? Absolutely. This is why it's so important for young people today, children at primary school age, to realise that they've got a value, but equally, all of the other children around them have got a value as well. And it's about, it's about respect, about respecting each other. And I think if we can build a society based upon respect uh, for other people, then maybe bullying will, will decrease somewhat, yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Iba, because it's, it's a really difficult experience because I was also bullied when I was, I don't know, 12 or something like that. And it was horrible because, you know, girls, um, I'm, a, I'm a woman, but, you know, when we are all young, to, to be honest, boys as well, we, you know, regardless of gender, children can be really mean to each other. <laughs> I think that's, that's it, you know, children are, you know, it's whilst they're, they're finding their place in the world. Well, how do I fit in? You know, and they tend to sort of follow the strongest. You know, when you've got a leader and you've got other people that are sort of maybe followers, then, you know, it's like this pack, this pack of people that sort of gang up on a couple of other people. And it is horrible, but, but again, to, to me, what it says is that a lot of people have got insecurities and they feel the need to be part of something bigger, even if they're attacking someone or something else, to feel that they've got a place and a purpose. And, and that's really sad. We want people to have realize they've got their own value without the needing to resort to behavior like that. Yeah. Absolutely, 100%. And then, you know, you said that after you sort of um, left your, your school and did it sort of, you know, did that experience and the emotions you had that you were excluded, you know, from other girls, did they sort of follow you? Yeah, it definitely did follow me. I, I went into college and I just, I, I completely went off the rails. Uh, part of that was because for the first time I'd come into contact with the male sex. And of course, being at an all girls boarding school. Um, so of course, you, we haven't been taught how to interact and it might sound silly and it might, might sound naive, but that's the way it was. I had no idea, you know, that there were these strange, you know, men and things, you know, and they were like aliens from outer space, but in a good way. And um, yeah, I, I went completely off the rails. And I think that was partly because of my upbringing, which was very sheltered, um, the school, which was very, uh, very dominating, very archaic in its values and its teachings and its behaviors towards students. It wouldn't be allowed now. You would not have a school like that now, okay? It would not be allowed. And I think all of those things, plus the bullying experience. Um, and I was trying to find my place in the world. It was like, well, what am I about, you know? Do I have to be bullied everywhere I go? Am I going to be ignored by everyone? And yeah, I, I sort of made a lot of mistakes, but there were experiments I needed to make because I was really uncertain about where I fitted in, in this great big world. You know, I, I was sort of believing all the negativity that the bullies had offloaded onto me at school. I was believing that I was that person. So I, I was really struggling to cope and it, it, it took me a long time to get to a half decent place and I'd probably argue it wasn't until I met Mike that actually I started to calm down a bit and think okay well I do have a value I can do this and I can do that that's how long it's taken um but even now yeah you know I I, I feel the repercussions of it it doesn't ever leave you not ever yeah absolutely um thank you for for sharing that um I absolutely agree <laughs> um all right um so um Mike uh, Michael and um, for you and um, 
So I'm just sort of reading out one of the questions that I was thinking. Um, so you, uh, you were almost indifferent to suicide um, before your daughter Anna, um, Anna left. And um, tell us a, a little bit about um, her, please. Like, what was she like when she was growing up? Well, uh, it's now rather difficult because everything's colored by what's happened. So I sort of, there's a, there's a block on going back too far because in a way it's a bit painful to think about. Uh, I've got photographs obviously everywhere of her, but she was a very, uh, she was very sensitive. And um, that she's one of, one of five. So I, I attempted, I'm not saying I succeeded. I t attempted to be equally fair to all of them. So there weren't any favorites or anything like that, although it's difficult to maintain an equilibrium and somebody says, oh, you favor, yeah. that sort of thing is risky. But mm -hmm. we all, I mean, I did get on extremely well with her and uh, she was very supportive. And um, like everybody, you know, she had difficult times, she had difficult relationships um, before she got married. But um, I think her basic quality was, uh, and it, 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 it's, it's sad to think that somebody who cared so much, she, she cared a lot. She remembered, you know, birthdays, anniversaries, incidents, happenings, places you've been, experiences you had. She would always remember it well, uh, above and beyond anyone else. And that's, that's a very, um, you know, it's a very endearing and valuable resource that she had because I don't always remember them or I remember different things. So it, it, it was, you know, and, and it was at that time that she it was about to commit suicide that she rang and we, we often had conversations. I knew exactly what she was doing. Well, I knew as much as I could know. I was working on Hillsborough, which was a long running inquest. So I was living with Yvette um, very near where it was happening, which is Warrington in Cheshire. So I wasn't in London. And obviously I've had a job which hasn't made it easy to maintain an intimate contact with everybody, not as intimate as I think I should have had it. Anyway, I realized she was in trouble. She, she felt, well, she felt two things. One, she felt she was being watched. She felt there was surveillance on her. She felt very, very vulnerable. She's working for a communications company, big one. And secondly, on top of that, you know, she was, um, well, she wasn't told straight out. She gathered along with everybody else. They were going to lose their jobs. So like all these big companies, especially some of them are being American, that they, they're not very good at handling this personal relationships. So she realized before they actually told her that she was going to lose her job. Now for her, that was a slight upon her character, she thought, and made it difficult at home because she helped to provide them you know, resources for the home. And she's got two young children, both of whom had a, a serious but unusual blood disease, which required constant attention and the risk that if you didn't get that attention in time, either of them could die. Now that's quite a responsibility for her. So I think from being a sort of very caring and carefree, she's, she's sort of absorbed a lot of the world's troubles and into her family. I mean, I could go on, but that gives you a picture, I think. Absolutely, it does. Um, um, thank you for sharing that with us, Michael. Um, and, and please tell us if it's difficult to talk about this, because my, my next question was going to be um, how you sort of um, found out that, that you know, she um, took her own life. Mm. Well, it, 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 having discovered from her that she had these problems, uh, we had agreed that we would go down and see her in, in, on a Saturday, possibly a Sunday. So um, that, that was the plan. We were going to go and talk her through it all. 
and hopefully, you know, not, not necessarily provide lots of answers, but provide an opportunity to offload, which of course is what we're doing with SOS, is providing opportunities for people to offload. And at six o'clock in the morning of the Friday before the Saturday, when I was due to go to court that day, it was a quite important day, I had this phone call at dawn from a relative. And uh, I, I'm not critical of her because how do you break that news? She was convinced I didn't know and it had happened the night before. And so and I, and she said, I've got some news, do you know? And of course I, I said, well, six o'clock in the morning, what news is that? What can it be? No, I don't know. And she just said, you know, she just said Anna's dead. And of course, when it's said like that, you kind of, um, you have to adjust everything and you stop and you ask the person to repeat it. Have I got it right? I could have misheard. And when it was clear that it wasn't a mistake and it had happened and obviously that person couldn't do more, I said, well, thank you for telling me. Uh, I just need, and then you have the kaleidoscope of feelings. You have, you know, you have grief, you have anger because Anger, you know, why? I was going to see it tomorrow. Why, why have you done it now? Of all, you know, so you blame her, then you blame yourself. that You didn't understand that that was about to happen. And so you have this hot pot of feelings, which you can't really sort out other than you don't know where to turn. Well, luckily, obviously, I was living with the vet, so I had a lot of support there. And I had another friend staying who I'd known a long time, very rare for somebody to be staying, but there was somebody staying who knew her and knew me. And uh, I also had a backstop, which I didn't appreciate till later, and that's all the Hillsborough families, because they understood, because they lost people who wanted to live. The irony was I'd lost somebody who didn't want to live, but the, the impact is the same. So it was difficult, but it took a long time come to terms with it, but I decided in the end, the short version is, it was her decision. And if she was sitting where you're sitting, she just, I know she'd lean across and say, Dad, just shut up, get on with it. You know, it's fine. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I um, really appreciate that. <laughs> um, all right, so, um, if, it, if, if um, I would like to ask you some more questions about um, mental health before we talk about your, you know, um, the charity you both um, um, co-founded, the Silence of Suicide SOS. And um, so, if it, I um, I I read, you know, um, some of the articles about about sort of your life story, and I'm not sure to talk about. I just came across it, <laughs> and um, <laughs> where, where is this? <laughs> And then it says that um you know unfortunately when when you know uh, when you're sort of youngish you 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 had a, a boyfriend who who was quite almost abusive and you know you were sort of physically and also mentally you know quite abused by your your boyfriend and and some other relationships um you you've had afterwards um you had a kind of similar you know unfortunately and um, partners which made it quite difficult for you would you be able to tell us um, a little bit about that, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know what, uh, what I would like to start uh, say at the start, for anyone that's been through this or, or knows people that have, you know, <laughs> it's very hard to make any sense out of it, especially if there's more than one relationship that you've had whereby you have suffered abuse, whatever form that abuse takes. Because I've often sat here and thought, why? Why didn't I see it coming? Why didn't I stop it? You know, why did it happen in the first place? And, you know, that's that's a question that is never answered. I, can, I cannot answer it for the life of me. Uh, you know, was it my fault? And I think a lot of people go through that. You know, am I giving off some kind of like, you know, I, I don't know, sort of little invisible signals that say, you know, I'm vulnerable, you can abuse me. Uh, you know, I, I don't think I am, but am I? because I seem to attract the same type of person. And um, in the first instance, which was, was when I was very young, I was just, I just turned 19. 
and I was thrown off a, uh, a bridge um, uh, by someone I, I was seeing. And um, I'm very lucky to be here, very lucky to be here. Um, so there was, there was that. And I think, you know, I was really young at the time and you kind of, you bounce out of it. I think when I was younger, I, I had a resilience to kind of block things out and I could move forward. But as I've got older, they've crept more and more into my conscious thoughts and, and I'm being forced to face them and forced to face the things that happened to me. Um, and that might be because a bit later on, I was in a relationship with someone who was abusive in just about any way you could imagine, any way, uh, sexually abusive, financially abusive, psychologically abusive, physically abusive, every single kind of abuse you can imagine receiving, he was giving to me. And um, yeah, I think that, oh, that's tough, that's tough. And I, and I feel for anyone, male or female, or, or however they identify in terms of gender, um, it is really tough because it does something to you, it breaks a part of you. And even though I consider myself quite a strong person and I, and I can stand up for myself, Michael will vouch for that. And I can stand up for myself and I will speak my mind. But equally, there are times when I all of a sudden I feel scared. And I think I can't say what I really want to say because what if there's a negative reaction to it? Um, or silly things like, you know, uh, Michael might walk out of the room and the door shuts because there's a wind. And I like literally jump out of my skin. And this is some time on, you know, and check these things that they're there in our subconscious, but they permeate our conscious life so often. And with me, it, it's been happening more and more often. And it is distressing. It is really distressing. And I think one of the hardest parts for me is um, not just what it did to me, but it affected my children as well, um, because my children were put through things that they should never have been put through. Thank you for thank you for sharing that. It's it's always really emotional. I, I know um I have no kids but whenever I talk about my mom or my deceased father I can't stop crying again. So um thank you so much for sharing that. Um so um, I would like to ask you a question for both of you, because, you know, after your, um, <laughs> um, you know, after, you know, for, for Ibe yourself, you know, to, to sort of um, having experienced this uh, bullying and, you know, abuses and, and all that. And for, for Michael yourself, you know, after losing Anna um, to, to suicide, you, you haven't, you know, you, you, you didn't fall. You, you know, you, you set up this amazing charity, SOS Silence of Suicide, to help um, more people, um, you know, and um, having suicidal thoughts and stuff. So either of you, would you like to tell us um, how you get to sort of set up this um, silence of a suicide, please? Um, it seemed natural, didn't it? It seemed a natural thing to do for both of us. I think it, it, it yes, it, it was uh, an evolutionary mm. situation in which uh, Yvette had lost a, a friend three or four months before, yeah. which we talked about a bit, but not a lot. She'd take me to where he lived, and so, so I knew a little bit about it. And mm. I think that the the catalyst was going to Anna's funeral. One, I suddenly realized the sort of network, hinterland of friends she'd got, hundreds, mm -hmm. turned up. That was the first point. Second point was that I decided, uh, yeah, I, I, I spoke in, in the chapel and I spoke, it was a sort of big reception for everybody. And I thought it would be good just to say a few words. And I can't remember exactly what I said, other than I must have said that I, you know, wanted everybody to be aware that, you know, it was suicide. And, you know, we, we should 
accept that, even though I was having difficulty accepting it, we should accept it because, as I just said, you know, it was her decision. Anyway, having said that, you know, when I stopped speaking, which I did eventually, <laughs> people came out, you know, I know what you're about to say. Um, I didn't go on for that long. But a lot of people came around. Now, what do I mean by a lot? Well, for, uh, there were about 300 there, so 30, 40 people came around and they said, wow, what you said? I said, what did I say? They said, you, you use that word. Sorry, what's the word you're talking about? Anna? No. They said, no, you said suicide. And I said, well, that's what it was. And it's, you know, it's a Latin word and it's, you know, taking sui, your, your own life. That's what it is. Uh, and I'm not going to dress it up and call it something else. And then they said, but you, you know, and then they started talking between each other. And a teacher would say to the someone else who works at the school, because it was held in a school. I didn't know you'd lost your husband. I didn't know you'd lost your brother. I didn't know you'd lost your neighbor. Mm -hmm. So the number of people who said, this means a great deal that you're able to talk about it. And I said, well, uh, that's an interesting insight. So I, when I got back home with Yvette, I said, it, it would be a living memorial for Anna if I could, we could create for the people we know who had taken their lives, something that would carry them into the future and provide, not solace, but would provide support for others. People who may be thinking about it, people who've attempted it, people who've been bereaved. They just need an opportunity to offload because the stigma is still there. And people feel that they're at fault, so they don't want to talk about it. Families don't talk about it. Cultures don't talk about it. Certain cultures, you, you can't talk about it. So we thought, we'll, we'll, we'll start this. And it's the only organization, and I hate using that word, but it's the only gathering group, whatever, where this happens. The Samaritans are good at listening. I don't know, they've been very supportive. Mind also, you know, provides all sorts of research facilities and so on. But... No one has actually brought people together for a sole purpose of not talking at them, but just getting them in the room, wherever we are, sitting them down and saying, over to you. you, you talk and let other people in the room know they're not alone. And somebody who's thinking about suicide knows what you as a bereaved parent or whatever you are, bereaved relative, thinks about it and how they're trying to cope with it. And then Yvette is the interlocutor in a sense because she's very, very good. The interlocutor. Yeah. I've never heard that word before. Interlocutor. I'm an interlocutor. <laughs> no, I haven't heard it before. I just made it up. <laughs> you just made it up. <laughs> I just made it up. Um, no, there is such a word. I think maybe I've got I've missed a syllable somewhere. Anyway, she's very good at sitting down with people. Because normally we've got, well, sometimes we've got 10 people. Sometimes we've got 110 people. So it depends. So sit down with people in front of everybody and just say, and you, you, you're able to identify before they've spoken, they've got something to say. And you're usually right. They have got something to say, but they're a bit slow, a bit reluctant. And gradually they talk. Once one person talks, then they all want to talk. And they've got stories to tell that are remarkable. Yeah. And then at the end of it, nearly all the ones we used to do. I mean, we, we haven't been able to do it for about just over a year now, but this, that sort of meeting, anyway. we would um, be approached by them and they'd just say, they can't say to both of us, just say, thank you. Mm. You've helped us in a form of mental liberation. We've been wanting to do this, but we've never felt able. Now we feel able. I, th I think it's once they've started the conversation, they feel they can continue it, you know, and they take it and they run with it. But sometimes the most difficult part is starting it. And, and that's where we come in and we help people generate those words. Sorry, our catch just joined in. If you can hear her meowing, she's talking to you all as well. <laughs> What, what's your cat's name, Yvette? <laughs> Our cat has a couple of names, but tonight she's known as Rugrat. <laughs> Rugrat? Rug, 
<laughs> just call her rug <laughs> yeah. oh i can I, I heard the rug oh lovely to, um so well thank you michael. yeah thank you michael for, for sharing how um sos silence of suicide um was formed and so yvette as a, as a ceo of um you know silence of suicide um ceo of a charity i can imagine you have a lot going on every day to run a charity and to support so many people and volunteers and and so on could you tell us a little bit about you know what you do um, as part of the charity work please well first of all i don't have a normal day and secondly i lose a lot of hair every day okay <laughs> so there's two things two really important things to remember I mean, it's, you know, you always have to be prepared for the unexpected and never expect anything to be normal because it's not, things come at you from all directions. So in any one day, we're focusing on things from, okay, you know, what resources do we need on board to help um, focus on specific projects? Uh, or what else can we do that nobody else is doing to help support people out there? Um, so, you know, your, your mind is constantly thinking of ways to evolve the service, to grow the service, but the end aim is always to increase the level of support uh, and increase the, num the number of people that you are supporting. So it really is a, a very, a very all-consuming role. Um, and of course, then the supporting our volunteers who do an absolutely great job, but we have a huge responsibility to them to make sure that they're okay. Because when you are taking calls from vulnerable people, that is not easy, it, you know? And we have people come to us say, yeah, I can do that. I'm a really good listener. And it's great, they are good listeners, but it doesn't mean they're going to be great in this environment because it's very different. So trying to get that through to people can be quite hard. And of course, we spend a lot of time training people. The, the, the training is extremely robust. Um, and at the moment, we're focusing on our skydive. We've got a skydive against stigma, guys, on the 1st of May at Hinton Airfield in Brackley. Um, and uh, we have five people jumping for us. And it's actually... No, I'm not, no, 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 not me. <laughs> he doesn't know yet. I'm sending him up with a parachute. Um, but we have five people jumping for us. It'll be the sixth anniversary of Anna's death by suicide. So it really is an important date. So it's raising awareness, raising money. And then we've got another couple of projects as well. So it's like, it's really full on, isn't it? It's full on, but do you know what? It's, um, I have my moments, don't get me wrong, because I'm human. I'm like, oh my God, I can't cope. Michael, take me away from all of this, you know? And this poor man has to put up with it all. But, you know, I wouldn't change it for anything because- Oh. <laughs> for, for, no, I, I wouldn't. I really enjoy it. And for all the, all the hours, all the late nights, all the problems, the fact is, when you know that you're helping people and you've made a difference to how they see themselves and how their lives map out, then, you know, you can't get a greater reward. Well, I, I think you need to explain, or have you? I don't think you have. I haven't, anyway. Um, mm. But what we're doing at the moment is not what we started off doing. No. Because no. of COVID, mm. the service that we're trying to provide has had to change because we can't go into the community and organize these gatherings of people. It all is like this, or more particularly, and the thing that's taking up your time, along with others, some, one, some of whom are watching this, is providing a, a telephone line. Mm. And that's what we've tried to do, again, not along the lines of the Samaritans, which is just to listen, but we want to engage with people who, well, they may be on the verge, but they may not be quite on the verge, but there are very few people who are not stressed at the moment, yeah. one way and another, yeah. and, and need to vent the stress. Yeah, and, and I think I should just mention at this point, actually, that World Senior Snooker, who, as you mentioned at the very start, I'm on the board of, uh, with our official charity partner, and, and they have been really helpful in, in helping us to sort of set this up um, and, and grow this. So it's been, it's been great um, being involved in a sporting capacity as well, because obviously some sports can be very isolating. You know, a lot of people are training on their own, they're practicing on their own, 
performing on their own a lot of the time and and that you know can present its own set of problems for people so just a bit of a but thank you, you to them yesterday you worked out how many calls you'd had in the last six months or something, or? oh yes yes we're actually quite excited about this because uh I saw a post from the Samaritans, right? And um, one day I'm, I want to catch up with the Samaritans or right, in like a hundred years time or something, because they do a fantastic job, um, no doubt about it. They really do. And they take uh, their volunteers that spent a million minutes on the phone since lockdown began, which is huge um, on the phone or, or with emails. And I thought, well, I wonder what our stats are then. Now we only started in August last year. And until October, we were only open for two hours a day. So I was really pleasantly surprised to see that since August, we've taken 22,000 calls into our line. And I was like, you know what? I think we should be really pleased with that. And yeah, thank you. And that's testimony to the hard work of, of everyone within SOS and our volunteers. And, and also, you know, a big thank you to those people that who do use our service because they trust us and, and they like what we do and uh, it's fantastic that it works for so many people so yeah we're really happy really happy that's that's amazing that when you when you started only um a few months ago and, and so many people have found it that's amazing um, congratulations <laughs> oh. um, we have some comments um coming through in the chat so if you don't mind let me just uh, have a look um let me see so actually, Vicky joined this chat um, very, very at the beginning. So thank you, Vicky. Um, so Vicky had a question. Would it be possible for SOS um, to share the YouTube link to our social media platforms after, please? Is that OK? So yeah, um, do you have a YouTube link event for, for SOS? A YouTube link? Yeah. Yes, we do. We actually, our YouTube channel is literally untouched, guys. I'm really sorry. But there is. Can I get it over to you via email afterwards? Yes. Because I don't know what it is off the top of my head. But yes, we do. Yes, thank you. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Yvette. If you do that, then I'll share it back with the audience afterwards. So Vicky, thank you for the question. We'll share it um, afterwards um, on the LinkedIn website. And then uh, Vicky had another sort of comment for both of you. I always get so emotional when I hear Michael talk about Anna. And I'm so proud of both Mike and Yvette for turning such a heartbreaking situation into a positive with SOS. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Vicky. That's oh. a very, very lovely comment. And we had another um, sort of comment from Joy. It's hard to talk about it, but when you come through the other side, it gets easier. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Very true. And there is another um, comment from Hope. When I lost my dad, I found SOS a great source of comfort and closure. I'm quite vocal about mental health now, and I truly believe SOS is an amazing platform to talk about what a lot of people think is the elephant in the room. Oh, thank you, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you all of you that have have made such lovely comments. Thank you, that's, uh, and this is it. You know, why does anyone keep going? You keep going because you know that there are people out there that benefit from what you are doing. Yeah, and it's the old adage, that's, as long as there's even just one, that's enough. Yeah, exa exactly. It's not about, it's not about how many, it's knowing that at least someone has, yeah. you've helped make a difference yeah. or you've helped them make a difference because actually you're not the reason they're making a difference you're helping them to make the difference for themselves mm. you know you're, you're giving yeah. them that bit of belief that they can actually change things you know when they when they feel that they can't they feel completely unable or incapable but actually they have got that capability you just need to get that belief that self-belief mm. into them and that that's really all we're doing is just helping people to believe in themselves absolutely completely um so I have um, another question for both of you. So this is really more about um, healing process or gr grievance process, how to come to terms with um, you know, losing your loved ones to suicide. If I'm honest, I haven't yet come to terms with uh, my dad's suicide um, 30 odd years after, um, which is weird because uh, I don't know him. He died when I was one. 
but um, he does. He stays with me. He doesn't leave. Do you know what I mean? Um, so just wanted to ask both of you. So, you know, obviously, Mike, you know, your your daughter Anna, you know, um, her leaving you, and Eva, I I believe you also lost your really close friend to to um, mm. side. So, would you either of you would like to um, tell us a little bit about how sort of your grievance, you know, um, grief? Sorry, not grievance, grief process or healing process has has been since you you've lost your loved one i mean for, for for me i i must admit um shock in all cases i i have lost too many people to suicide um shock is always there and and there's that one question isn't there that i'm sure we all ask why there are so many questions and they're all prefixed by why, why didn't I know, why didn't they tell me, why, blah, blah, blah. it's always why. And the truth is, look, you know, we're, we're never going to have the answers, so you have to try and make peace with it, you have to. And I think as Mike said earlier on, the, the way I do it is that, okay, they took a decision, I may not agree with that decision, and I may think to myself, if only they'd spoken to me, maybe I could have changed their minds, but in a way that's a bit arrogant because Maybe I couldn't have done. You know, I'm assuming I could have done. So I kind of put it into that kind of context that people took a decision. People that I love, I've known for a long time, took a decision. And, and that's the way I'm able to live with it. And obviously have, have memories and, and, and do things like, like SOS. Because I think that helps both of us. Doing what we're doing it helps both of us work through our own losses as mm. well. You know, so by helping others, we are actually helping ourselves, even though that's not the aim of it. But I'm finding that's what's happening. And another person that I lost, with, who, who I work with, was a work colleague, a lovely, sweet man, just such a sweet, lovely person. And um, he was signed off with mentally poorly. And while he was signed off mentally poorly, he, he got a letter saying he'd been made redundant which was shocking, shocking um, handling of things. And uh, his wife got home that day and he'd hung himself. And uh, it was just horrific. And I think, yeah, I was really angry at that. I was really angry because it just seemed so unjust. And I thought like, getting angry, okay, let's channel the anger in the right place. So again, doing something like SOS, it's like make a difference so these things don't happen again so we met with Theresa May and we've fed into the government's paper on mental health in the workplace and it's by doing positive things like that that it helps to control your grief and it channels your grief and if you can try and drive change so that it reduces that happening again then I think at least something positive can come out of it sorry um no, no, I mean, I haven't got much else. No, I have. I mean, what? Oh, that's unusual. <laughs> don't worry, darling. Don't worry. <laughs> You're so naughty. Anyway, um, now I was going to say something that you may not be expecting, but you may not be expecting either. In a way, what happened then and what has been happening with SOS has now become overtaken. Because the pandemic that we're living in, it's easy, you know, you're sitting there, I'm sitting here, but um, we're within uh, not a socially distanced bubble. But um, we are living in a very unreal situation and I'm learning of death, people I know, every other day. And deaths that they have no control over. They didn't choose to die. So it's a rather different situation. I'm not saying everybody who commit suicide necessarily chooses because some are disabled, but uh, for those who do. So it's a very different situation. And also it's a situation in which there's confusion. There is certainly a lack of clarity, uh, particularly from government. And, uh, you know, uh, really coming to grips with a very new reality, which is going to affect all of us. And, you know, people have got different visions about how this is going to work. And what is crucial in this, it's for me anyway, and, and for the people who ring up, I no doubt, and, and for others, some who may be contemplating, you know, just chucking it all in and saying it's not worth it. 
is trying to instill what I, what I would have tried to do with Anna, but I'm not saying it would have succeeded, is it, just, uh, you know, hope is an easy thing. It's, it's really to say, yeah, it's quite difficult to, to instill that in anybody because they either have it or they don't. And it, Anna left a note and it's perfectly clear what she meant when she wrote the note, which may not have been on the same day, but it must have been close basically saying she felt she'd failed. Failed as a wife, failed as a mother, failed as a worker, failed. Now, I'm not sure that I would have been able to turn that around. I might have helped because I tried to be very positive, however bleak it is, um, that there's a spark in everybody, a spark that has to be kept alive or aflame, however you want to draw an analogy. And I, and I think Finding the spark and the flame is the most I can do for somebody facing a dire situation, which is much larger now than it was when we started, because I think every other person underneath is really concerned about what's going to happen to them, their families, their children, particularly, you know, if they haven't got a job in the offing, if they haven't got security of tenure in a house or flat or a room or wherever they are. And, you know, they haven't got an economic blanket to sleep on. It's, it's appalling. So I, all of that now has kind of encompassed and enveloped SOS. So it's much bigger than SOS. So sorry, I mean, that's, that's so the way I'm dealing with it now is it's as if Anna's situation is now everybody's situation. Although it's not of their making. Yeah, I, I mean, what I, what I would say is that I think for a lot of people, they, they feel as they do psychologically because of usually multiple reasons. OK, so they've got financial issues. They may be worried about losing their jobs. Mm. Or, I don't know, the family's broken up. They can't see their children. It's not usually one thing. It's usually, you know, quite a few things. And it's, you know... How do we help these people address those issues? Because until we can sort of help them become more financially stable, so they're not worrying about how they're going to next pay the rent or the mortgage, uh, reassure them about their job so they stop fretting about that, unless you can help clean those slates up and give them some kind of reassurances, it can be very difficult. Because very often it's those are the things that are causing the psychological distresses that can lead on to thoughts and acts of suicide and, and and if people feel that things are never going to change unfortunately you know then they can take that last drastic step so there's lots of support that people need in society and, and our government I'm sorry but our, our government has got to start putting empathy and compassion ahead of markets and, uh, of and, market, and market, capitalism markets and profits it's absolutely got to we've got to put people first and i'm sorry yeah. it's not happening and until we start doing it you know this kind of uh mental mental health pandemic actually is is going to continue and continue what, what you've said there, I think, is really, really important um, for all of us. It's a really important message. So thank you very much for sharing that, both of you. We have some more sort of um, comments and messages coming through in the chat. So I'll just share that with you. So let's see. Um, I agree, Yvette, too many social pressures generate negative thoughts and sadness. Um, COVID is exposing us all to grief, especially when you feel it shouldn't have happened it still leaves you with a lot of questions yeah. the spark mike you're so right when it goes out the relatives don't necessarily see it mm. yeah. um, very true i think people you know sadly that the, the one thing that we have come across a lot is that you know people that have made the decision to end their life by suicide mm. are, are very good at appearing all of a sudden mm. as if everything is okay it's all right i'm feeling fine you know absolutely fine stop worrying mm. and, and we know that's because they, they feel unburdened because they've taken the decision mm. and you know they know they're not going to have to worry anymore because they, they've already made their plan mm. um so it you know people don't they don't necessarily see it um and that's not because any of us are to blame 
you know, because people, when people make decisions, mm. they can be very good at, 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 yeah. at making sure that those and decisions I did, I did are think, Yes, sorry. Kind of got, I, did. I mean, the, th the other thing we haven't really explained, we should have, is that unlike a lot of other organisations, but like the Samaritans, we're not in the business of persuading somebody to do something or not to do something. Mm -hmm. So we're not pejorative. We're not judgmental. But obviously, if there is somebody who we think is on the verge, on the brink, then I think what we want to do, and I, I think of Anna in this context, all I could do is to say, well, I mean, it seems a bit banal and a bit glib, you know, are you sure? It would be saying to them questions that cause them to re-examine themselves. Uh, not because you want to make sure that basically, if they've taken a decision, they really have thought it through. Now, one of the things, Mind uh, gave me this idea to begin with. They said, if you really want to make somebody think about, and they're talking about suicide, you know, and you've actually got to that stage, you, you say, all right, how are you going to do it then? And then they perhaps haven't quite thought how they're going to do it. You're going to stick your head in the oven. I, I see. Well, the oven, how are you going to seal it? When you get into the detail, somebody goes, oh, you know, then they, they say, I'm going to hang myself. How are you going to do that? On a stool or whatever? So I know how my daughter hung herself there. So the detail of something can sometimes cause people to pause. Another one is this. And this is, this is true, and it's on the, on the website. We've got a little film which uh, we use to introduce everything. It's um, hosted, in a sense, by Ruby Wax, but there are a lot of people on it. One person is a barrister who I was working with at the time, and he lost two people, his wife and his son, uh, within a year, same way. And he said, if she were here, and if I were able to talk to her, I'd say, look at the mess you've left. Look at what I have to do every single day. And in a way, he thought, wow, yeah, that, that, that would be going some if you could say that. Because he, he wasn't trying to be unkind. He was just trying to say, look, uh, this was early days when he gave this interview. It's, it's, and I know that it did play havoc with his life. And I mean, it could have led because there was another child he was bringing up as well. It could have led to enormous problems. And I think the person who's taking the decision, if that's what they're doing, and they're not mentally unstable, then they sometimes do have to think about the repercussions of the decision. Yeah. And that's a difficult one. But I would want to be able to say that to mm -hmm. somebody if they got that far. Are there other people involved here? Have you thought well, about it? I think you'd be surprised because I, I know that the feedback we get of our volunteers because there are forms they complete every week and, and I speak to them regularly. And, uh, and a lot of them do in fact have those conversations with themselves. They do say to us, you know, it's because I've got children that I'm not going to go ahead and end my life. Uh, you know, because what would happen to them? You know, what would they think of me if I did this? So a lot of people are absolutely, they're talking mm -hmm. it through in their own minds and, and they are deciding, okay, I, I'm not going to do that. But it doesn't mean they're still not struggling psychologically on a day-to-day -day basis. They are, they are, it's a battle for them to stay alive. Uh, and luckily for services such as SOS and many others, many other brilliant charities, you know, we're here for those people. And at least whilst they're talking, um, it's helping them feel just a little bit better. That's good. Um, yes, so, um, yeah, there is a comment um, coming through in the chat. Um, um, so what, what this, um, your, uh, my, Michael, your colleague, um, Barista, said, you know, sounds definitely harsh, but I agree with a tough question. As a therapist, I do ask the direct question, do you want to die? Yeah. We, um, on, on our phone lines, if someone phones us up and they actually say that there's immediate risk to their life or their safety, or we feel that there could be, our volunteers are trained to ask that question. 
okay? Uh, we put it in such a way that's on a scale of one to five, five, feeling you're fe five being you feeling immediately suicidal. Please tell us how you feel. Do you feel suicidal right now? And we, they are trained to ask, ask the question because it's important. There's no point shying away from the word. If we as a support line for these people can't say the word, how can we expect them <laughs> to say the word and feel relaxed and open about talking? You know, it's really important language is so important we're not about dramatizing things or you know blowing things out of proportion but I say it for what it is are you feeling suicidal it's just another word okay that's all it is it's just another word absolutely yeah <laughs> and um just my own personal story is that you know the repercussion or the impact it has you know if you lost your you know many people that, that you are so close to and Michael, obviously, you lost your daughter, Anna, and um, so the sort of impact of me losing my dad to suicide um, has been that sort of the, the sense of emotions that my family, my mom, my sister, and I feel is sort of resentment. <laughs> it's just sad, but it's resentment. We feel he didn't, but we feel he abandoned us. He did not. He he. Probably, I don't know, there was no suicide note apparently. So, you know, that's the thing. When someone takes their own life, you you cannot have a conversation with them to understand why they did that. So that's the sort of um, sort of question for me as a person, because I don't know why he did that. And um, so we feel sort of, I miss him, but I'm also, I feel a bit regent, you know, re re like, why did they, why, why did they, I was young, I was a young baby, my mom was beautiful, she, you know, she was casted to be Miss Korea when she was younger, why did they decide to take his own life? So I guess that's sort of the question for many of us who are left after our loved ones decided to take their own life. So completely agree what you said about repercussions and the impact of that. Really, With the, really, really sorry. And, and and we it doesn't make it any easier for you but this these are the kinds of conversations that we have with people all of the time and it's so important to fit, find your way your acceptance that you can live with because like you say you can't have that conversation you can't ask your dad why did you abandon me? Why did you abandon us? Why did you do that? You can't. So you have to find that answer for yourself. And, and in a way, there's a liberation there because you can give yourself whatever answer you want to that enables you to accept it. And, and I think maybe that that's, might be a way that you can approach it. Thank you, Beth. that's very kind. And um, so we have only about three minutes left. So I would like to um, <laughs> use this time for, um, so thank you both of you, Yvette and Michael, and for joining us tonight and sharing such, such intimate and, and difficult, you know, very, very private stories with us all. And um, um, so just want to ask um, a question for the SOS Silence of Suicide, the world's greatest, the smallest charity um, who makes <laughs> to everyone's lives every single day and, you know, saving people's lives every single day. So even I know, you know, you, um, there is a volunteer sort of recruitment form on your website. Um, could you tell us uh, briefly what this these volunteers for the phone line are supposed to do? So any of us, you know, tuning in tonight can um, join up, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is a volunteer application form on the website. You'll you'll see it clearly under the tab that says volunteers. Um, ideally, okay, because the service is growing, we are getting more and more calls, so we need more volunteers. Ideally, be in a position to to give us four hours a week of your time. Okay, you'd always be working from home. There is no office. All right, so that's a bonus. And you'd also train from home. Training is robust. It's over two days but it's ongoing as well okay uh so you're constantly monitored and mentored and refreshed and everything else and listen you've got to be able to listen first and foremost you've got to be able to listen because and create conversation but you cannot create conversation if you can't listen and take on board what the person has said and you know think about it seriously 
if you were talking to people that were seriously distressed, okay, and we're talking about taking their lives, and don't forget we're including children in this as well, okay, you might think you could handle it, but before you think about applying, I'd ask you to think again, could you honestly? Because it really is not as easy as you sound. And I'm not saying that to put people off. We want volunteers, but we would be remiss if we didn't spell it out how it is. It is not easy at all and not everybody can do it. Um, but if you're interested, if you think you've got something to offer, oh yes, and if you're reliable, please reliable, mm. <laughs> oh my goodness me, that would be a real bonus, um, then please do get in touch, okay? And if there's anything you wanted to discuss before filling in the form, then obviously there's an info um, at email address on the contact form, you can get in touch with me via that as well. And I'm happily, happily have a chat with you beforehand. Thank you, Yvette. So um, there will be the link to SOS Silence of Suicide websites and the volunteer and recruitment form in the YouTube um, description later on. So please do have a check. And if you are reliable and if you like listening, please, please um, join to save everyone's lives. And um, before we finish of today, um, so we have a um, comment from Joy. Great conversation. Thank you both. Um, perfect event, the ability to find your own answer. Oh, Absolutely. Oh, and you. can I just ask both of you, Yvette and Michael, maybe just, I know it's, it's not a really simple thing to say, but if anyone um, who's having suicidal thoughts um, are tuning in or watching it back through YouTube, is there anything you want to tell them? Ring SOS. <laughs> Ring SOS. Listen, okay, I, I know, know what it's like, all right? And you think, you really do think, you believe that nothing and no one can change where you are at that moment in time, you know, but things can change, all right? And we're here to help you and support you, so please get in touch. Right, and let's see if we can't just yeah. give you that bit of support that helps make a difference for you. You have to remember that you may think something and then when you try to articulate the thought, it changes. The moment you speak it, it changes. And as you speak, you begin to change with it. That's, that's very lovely. Thank you so much, um, both Yvette and Michael. I know you both of you are such busy people. <laughs> I do know. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much for taking the time and preparing the session. And before this session, you know, we exchanged a lot of emails as well, whilst you're going through such busy days, many days. So my genuine heartfelt thank you to both of you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. You're doing an amazing job. Well done for setting this up. And I'd just like to say thank you to everyone that's listened and everyone who watches later on YouTube. Hello and thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. <laughs> Thank you. And um, thank you so much. Um, just to detail what Eva said, um, we had, you know, those uh, audience and um, this audience, you know, tuned in Saturday night um, to hear from um, both Michael and Eva. Thank you so much and sharing your thoughts um, in the chat. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye bye.